everyone keeps telling me how my story is supposed to go. Nah, I'm gonna do my own thing. They always say three's a crowd. When it comes to the TV region, I like to say keep them coming. On that note, today I'm happy to present volume four of my top 25 most badass superhero scenes in the movies. That's called adrenaline, bitch. <laughs> Chloe Grace Moretz might not have gone on to become the star she deserves to be, but at least she's been in enough cult hits to have left her mark on the film industry. One such role is that of Hit Girl from everyone's favourite underdog franchise, Kick-Ass. I've always made sure to give her her credit for the fight scene she's pulled off, but I totally forgot about a little bout with Mother Russia. No, I'm not talking about the country. This is an artificial steroid monster who actually goes by the same name. I would have called this a cat fight. There's no way I can call that beast a cute little kitty. Anyway, the scene has its ebbs and flows, but the main point is that Hit Girl comes out on top, and that's all because of the one secret weapon all of us humans are blessed with, adrenaline. It's a pretty savage sequence if you actually take it seriously, and my only concern is that no human being should be standing after losing that much blood. Man, they should have called her Frankenstein's mother instead. Of course, the choreography is a bit too grand for real life, so it goes without saying, don't try this at home, folks. show you the real power of the crime. Optimus Prime is basically the Giga Chad of the robots, and he's proven it time and time again with some pretty badass flexes. I know it's usually Megatron who's on the receiving end, but this time I'm going to talk about how Mr. Prime ended both Scourge and Unicron with sass and violation in Rise of the Beasts. There's no doubting the fact that Scourge is an overpowered fighter, but the way he was ended was pretty humiliating because it didn't even look like Optimus was putting in a lot of effort. The fight in itself was pretty solid, and the general chaos around the scene led to a high-stakes situation. I also want to point out the fact that he and his buddies were fighting a whole bunch of other robots at the same time as well. However, Optimus doesn't like to play, so he lets it rip after he loses his patience. Bro literally said, I've had enough, and tears into his opponent as if he's dismantling a new action figure. Also, when Unicron says he can give Optimus anything he wants, and he simply replies with, then die, that was way too much sass for anyone to handle. Yeah, that's what you call a true power of a prime. Man, Peter Cullen still got it even after all these years of voicing the character. Don't prime. I can give you everything you want. Then die! Blue Beetle may have just come and gone from the box office, but that doesn't mean that the movie is without any merits. Take the final battle with Conrad Carapax, for example. It's such a great sequence that goes on for a decent amount of time. I mean, I love fight scenes and stuff, but sometimes the directors overdo it, especially if it's an overdose of CGI. Jaime Reyes puts on quite a solid display, and I think Zolo is an actor to consider for the future if he gets the right guidance. Of course, I also want to address the elephant in the room here. The Blue Beetle suit is very similar to Tony Stark's Iron Man suit. Hey, even Conrad Carapax kind of looks like Whiplash, but with a maroon suit. I mean, if I didn't know any better, I'd probably say that the writers didn't like the way Iron Man 2 ended, but they came up with their own badass version of a final match between Tony and Ivan. Like, come on. Do you not see the similarities here? One guy's busy blasting plasma cannons, and the other's got laser whips. I haven't really read the comics, so I don't know how close the designs are supposed to be. It kind of reminded me of that homework meme, too. Ah! This might hurt. If a movie named The Flash is only remembered for the appearance of Michael Keaton's Batman, then it tells us two things. One is that the film didn't have many redeeming qualities, and two is that the OG Bruce Wayne will never be topped in terms of legacy. I mean, I love Christian Bale, and I've also started showing up to Batfleck, but come on. Michael Keaton had the world going crazy in the late 80s and early 90s. He's the inspiration behind all the different Batman characters that came after him, and his allure still holds strong even today. The fight scene against those guards was a perfect example of his fighting skills, 
and yes, I know that an oldie like Keita would never be able to move like that. You can de-age him all you want, you can't bring back the muscles from his youth. However, what really stood out to me was the way Bruce Wayne says this might hurt, because it's pretty badass from both possible interpretations. Of course it's going to hurt for the guards because they're going to get their butts whooped by the original Dark Knight. More importantly, Batman knows he's not as strong as he used to be, so this fight might end up hurting him as well. Maturity really is an underappreciated character trait. <laughs> Being an epic martial artist means that you should be ready for a fight whenever the chance presents itself. In the case of Shang-Chi, we got to see him prove that point in the amazingly shot bus sequence. Bro started pulling moves as if Jackie Chan was instructing him from the side stand. Honestly though, I'm so glad they got an actor who was willing to go all in with the martial arts training. It just wouldn't be the same if it was someone who doesn't know much or just the basics and then lets the stuntmen do the heavy lifting. Of course, that's completely fine because stuntmen exist for a reason and they deserve so much more credit for the incredible things they do in films and TV shows, especially the dangerous stuff. However, for this, it has to be believable that Shang-Chi has been training ever since childhood. So I think it makes sense for the actor to portray at least the majority of his scenes without cutting to the stuntmen too much. In terms of martial arts and fighting, Simu Lu did justice to that part of the character, so I've got to hand it to him. Being the Sorcerer Supreme is no easy feat. It takes a lot of hard work, talent and funnily enough, lack of hair. Maybe that's why they gave the title to Wong and not Doctor Strange after the Ancient One decided to bid farewell. Of course, my focus here is on showing how badass she is, so let's talk about her fight against Master Cassilius. For starters, let me just say that it was one of the trippiest fights I've ever seen in my life. Of course, there's an even more intense sequence in the same movie, but that wasn't a fight. The best part about the Ancient One is that she's a woman of few words. There's no visible struggle or discomfort even as she takes on multiple opponents at the same time. Master Cassilius is a pretty formidable opponent by himself, but to take on his students and hold your own is the mark of a true badass. Also, I can't believe that Scott Adkins was a side character in this movie. That's freaking Yuri Boyka from the Undisputed franchise. His punches alone should be strong enough to break through any magical barrier. The Guardians of the Galaxy are primarily known for being a funny bunch with the occasional dose of emotional drama. Volume 3 probably hit me the hardest in the feels, and a lot of that had to do with Rocket Raccoon's story arc. This is exactly why the hallway fight scene is such a brutal sequence. There's obviously a lot riding on it, and the battle carries on for quite a while, which means more butt kicking for us to enjoy. I think it's the biggest investment James Gunn has ever made in an MCU fight scene. You know, the one thing I like the most about such scenes is that you get to see the team fight as a single unit. Everyone's helping each other out, and you can say that it's an actual group effort. The Avengers are cool and stuff, but whenever they fight, it's like each member's doing their own thing. That's probably because the actors playing them are high profile and need more screen time, but even then, it's the Guardians who fight like a real family. Hm, I wonder if that's because of the Vin Diesel effect. No one comes to save you, good guy! Ah! You keep calling me the good guy. I'm not the good guy. I'm the bad guy! 
Sylvester Stallone is a true success story. Bro went all out for Rocky and took the world by storm. Bro even wrote the whole script by himself. Lots of popular roles followed, but he's not as talked about today as he was back then. However, after watching Samaritan in 2022, I think it's safe to say that the old man still got it. That final showdown came across as such a twist because everyone was wondering whether Samaritan was alive or not, and nobody even considered if Nemesis had survived that fateful encounter. Of course, the real standout was when he says, you keep saying I'm the good guy, I'm not the good guy, I'm the bad guy. Damn right he's the bad guy, and not in a Billie Eilish kind of vibe. This should really have been a series. Had they slowly built it up, kept the boy at distance for the first few episodes, done some good flashbacks, and flushed out the relationship between the brothers, and the big reveal of the hero being Nemesis would have been insane. The only thing missing from such an amazing concept is the presence of Sly's biggest rival, Arnold Schwarzenegger. When it comes to Christopher Nolan's epic trilogy, people usually like to point out The Dark Knight or the first half of The Dark Knight Rises. However, I've always made it a point to highlight Batman Begins because that film has so many gems. I mean, Bruce Wayne probably flexes the most in this film and we also got to see the Batmobile in full flow. Yeah, I know they call it Tumblr, but come on bro, Batmobile has such an epic ring to it, doesn't it? More than anything else, the chase scene was so well done that it made me wonder why people were shocked by stuff like the airplane crash in Tenet. Nolan's clearly been doing this for a while and the Tumblr chase scene proves it. Now, I don't know if this is true, but I felt that I should at least mention it. Basically, while they were filming this scene in Chicago, a drunk driver ran his vehicle into the side of the Batmobile. When asked why he did it, he claimed the vehicle was an alien spacecraft and he was just trying to defeat it. Well, it is Batman's car, so it's a lot harder to defeat than an alien ship. Franco! There's no Avengers team without Black Widow and I'd already fallen for her way back in 2010. Iron Man 2 may have been all about Tony Stark, but Natasha Romanoff made sure to stand out in the limited screen time she had. Let's be honest here, if Scarlett Johansson's flexing her skills, then gonna sit there, gonna watch like a good boy. Those hammer guards clearly didn't know the drill and that's exactly why they had their butts handed to them in savage fashion. You know, people say Black Widow has no superpowers, but I'd say being able to do all that with her hair down is at least as good of a bonus as Super Soldier Serum. The woman actually took down like 10 guards in the same amount of time. Happy struggle to defeat one guy. Yeah, no wonder Iron Man said he wanted one like Natasha. Also, this is by far the best that Black Widow has ever looked on screen. I wish they would have kept this hair for the majority of her other movie appearances. It looks and fits a character so much better than most of the other hairstyles she's used. Then again, <laughs> that's just me being a simp. Crack as many Aquaman jokes as you want. The creators of this film were listening to you back then, and I'm sure they're listening to you again now. There are a lot of nice things to say about this scene, but just the fact that they made the OG costume look cool was an achievement in itself. I swear, I would have personally given an Oscar to the costume design department just for Arthur Curry's suit. Moving on. The fight between him and the Ocean Master, aka his own brother, was a neat sequence that gave us a fair look at Aquaman's abilities. I mean, his moves even made Volko smile because that was the technique. He was trying to train Arthur for so long. Look, I'm aware of the drama around Jason Momoa cosplaying as Johnny Depp to mess with Amber Heard. That's not the reason behind placing him at number 15. It's a genuinely enjoyable final battle, even if the family reunion at the end did make it a little cringy. All I know is, I really wanted a trident after watching this fight. What's your name, mister? Uh, 
Logan. Who else can portray a brutal anti-hero mutant in one film and glide across the stage in a tuxedo belting out show tunes in another? Hugh Jackman does it all and that's exactly why we love this hunky Australian with all of our hearts. The Wolverine was a massive upgrade from X-Men Origins and there are tons of scenes to prove it. One of them is the bar fight where Logan shows off his new hair and toys with the local jerks. On a serious note, I love Wolverine's mountain man look. It makes him look more like an animal which kind of ties in with his whole brand doesn't it? I was actually hoping to see him tear some stuff Fun. But then I remembered this was a PG-13 film. Bro didn't even have to unleash his claws for this one. He got his way here just with his words and that too in a funny way. I mean, sure he was going to go berserk after that bottle smash, but I'm glad Yukio took over from there. She was right about not wasting any time on those dudes because they clearly weren't worth the effort. all about equality, so I always try to make sure the ladies get a mention whenever possible. Of course, the men always take the throne when it comes to badass scenes, but every now and then, a boss girl will show up to take our breath away. Valkyrie had her time to shine in Thor Ragnarok, and she made sure to make it count, especially when she rescues Thor, only to capture him again. I know this is supposed to be a funny scene and all of that, but do you realize that Valkyrie just kills all those kidnappers as if their lives meant nothing? Well, in context, that might be true, but still a brutal way to do so. It basically shows us that Valkyrie is a character who doesn't care one bit about who she's up against. That shit was pretty impressive too. It gave off a VR kind of vibe, you know? The funniest part was the way she managed to knock out the God of Thunder with a simple shock device. Seriously though, that neck zapper is the most impressive piece of tech I've seen in all of the MCU. They should have used the larger version of the same thing on Thanos. Thor wouldn't even need to aim for the head. He's mine. He did take the focus of Volume 3, but Rocket Raccoon also had a pretty badass moment in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. It's when he takes on those ravages in the middle of the night while Groot to sleep. My favourite part of this is the music itself because the soundtrack is outstanding. The way it's incorporated does take a lot of creative skill. I don't know if you noticed, but Rocket's using the music as a distraction and a false location to trick the ravagers. He's also using it to keep Groot calm so he doesn't freak out and get scared. It just goes on to show that Rocket has so many layers to him and I used to hate the fact that most people would just see him as the comic relief character. Yeah, I mean, I know he's primarily supposed to be that guy, but I'm glad he'd get more exposure in the final installment of the franchise. After all, to truly understand the purpose of Rocket being there, you have to look past his humorous personality and focus on his actual human side, or, or his raccoon side, I suppose, whatever works. This is why I love him. He's loyal to his friends and ruthless towards enemies. This movie hasn't aged well as most people would have thought, but even then I'd say it was a pretty solid effort. Seeing Scarlett Johansson is always a pleasure, and to see her beat up a bunch of goons in supernatural fashion is even better. I really like the cinematography because it gives me a sense of nostalgia, even though the movie isn't even a decade old. I guess movies really have changed a lot since 2014, haven't they? Honestly though, I'll never understand what a bold guy is thinking when they see something impossible happen. I mean, all their guns randomly get stuck to the ceiling and they're like, well, maybe my fist will be more effective against this force. Like, what on earth are you thinking, bro? That lady's a catastrophic nerd. Run for your freaking life. The best part is that she isn't even doing anything. It's all because of her mind. I swear, if I could activate my brain's powers like that, I'd probably go out of control. Open it.
it's time to enter my top 10, so I've got to use someone epic. As it turns out, Batman is the best possible choice. The Dark Knight will forever be remembered because of a character known as the Joker, but that doesn't mean Bruce Wayne was a side character in his own movie. He pulled off feats that only metahumans or Giga Chads would consider doable. One of those achievements was against the SWAT team during the unconventional hostage situation. It's probably one of the most underrated action sequences in film history. This scene rocked. The background score perfectly complemented the gravity of the situation. There was a strong dynamic with Batman's sonar vision in between. The fight in itself was amazing and the final result just felt so satisfying. Batman's clever tactics in beating the SWAT team to the hostages, tying them up and leaving them dangling on the side of the scaffolds was the mark of a true badass. Also, I just noticed for the first time after countless viewings that he turns his sonar off when he hears the clown's muffled struggles. This allows him to immediately surmise the truth of the hostage situation with his own eyes. It was incredible attention to detail. His gadgets are known to give him untold advantages, but it's his natural skill that carries him through. Your power grew until it became uncontrollable. You know, he's not exactly a hero, but then again, he's not a villain either, so we'll just let him in under the anti-hero tag, okay? Black Adam received a lot of praise here at the TV region, but it's mostly for two scenes, and all my regular patrons would know exactly what I'm talking about. However, the moment where he enacts revenge over what was done to his family has got to be one of the most dangerously thrilling sequences to watch. We all know that Black Adam doesn't have much to live for, especially after what happened to him, but at the same time, his rage just gave off an impeccable vibe. The part where he says that destruction and death is what he wants truly freaked me out because you don't want somebody as strong as Black Adam living by such a philosophy. Come to think of it, this is a similar vibe to what Optimus Prime had done with Unicron, so I'm thinking Dwayne Johnson might have actually inspired that line. Of course, this is all just conjecture, so don't come at me in the comments, all right? While I strongly advocate against the use of violence, I don't think I could say much about enjoying it on the big screen. In retrospect, I never really realised how much more stylish and artistic the Guardians movies were when compared to the rest of the MCU. Seeing Yondu and Rocket Raccoon go berserk was a treat to the eyes, especially with Yondu's arrow going around ending lives in all of just two business minutes. Michael Rooker really made this character special. He got introduced as a seemingly forgettable angry boss villain for Star-Lord, ended up becoming one of the most awesome and unforgettable characters in the entire franchise with more heart and soul than most of the actual heroes. Having said that, I love how Yondu and Rocket are behaving more like villains here than heroes or anti-heroes. The sadistic smiles on their faces while they're mowing down all the ravagers felt like an amusement park ride with brutal murder. another one of the ladies. Even though she's not as loved as a Black Widow or a Scarlet Witch, anyway, she helps defy Thanos over here, so I'm not complaining. The main reason why Captain Marvel lands so high on this list is because she turns out to be the key force who turns the tides against the Mad Titan. Sure, Wanda was owning Thanos with her oddly overpowered magic, but he did pull an Uno reverse by launching a savage attack via his sanctuary ship. However, all of that changed when Brie Larson showed up in supersonic speed and turbocharged energy. The fact that she tore down an entire ship within just a few seconds was truly astounding and kind of reminded me of how Saitama destroyed that giant ship in the season finale of One Punch Man. Well, I suppose anime influences even the biggest Hollywood blockbusters. <laughs> If 
you're a new cop, right, and you get to see Batman in action on the streets of Gotham, you probably just sit by and relax. The other cop knew it too, which is why the whole, you're in for a show tonight, son, line hits so hard. It's like an understood thing. The Batman's going to clean up the criminals for the cops so they don't even need to bother interrupting him. Of course, newbies can be a little reckless, as could be seen in that awkward shot, but hey, everyone deserves a second chance, don't they? Bro, so badass, he tells his watch the time. No, but seriously, this is one of the best scenes of the Nolan trilogy because it instills a sense of faith and relief into the audience by bringing the star of the show into the limelight. I swear this dude's swag mode has no off button. You know, I still dream about the day we'll get to see the 2008 Hulk come back into the MC. That was such a deadly version of the character. I really wanted Edward Norton to continue with his role, but alas, can't always get what you can. The final battle between this Hulk and Abomination was a culmination of rage, power, and sass to everyone won at the end. The sequencing of the scene also made a lot of sense. First, you had Abomination dominating our angry green giant with ease, then Hulk sees his damsel in distress, Finally, he unleashes his true power to defeat the bad guy and get the girl. Well, actually, he doesn't get the girl, but at least they had something of a moment before Hulk has to escape the scene. Also, why did the cinematography change so much in the MCU? The OG Iron Man film and this one had such amazing color grading. It was basically the perfect version of what the DCEU was trying to achieve. <laughs> telling me how my story is supposed to go. Nah, I'm gonna do my own thing. Sometimes you just gotta take that leap of faith to show the world that you can defy the odds. We don't know if that's gonna work out for Mars Morales just yet, but at least the kid knows how to make a statement. I don't have anything against Miguel O'Hara's Spider-Man 2099, but the dude really needs to take a chill pill. I know that you've got way too much to handle. You gotta take it easy on Miles, bro. Anyway, their fight scene was pretty interesting to watch because for the most part, it was kind of like a chase sequence. Of course, that final shock attack by Spidey totally did the trick, and it was kind of cool to see the underdog surprise the man who was so easy easily dominating him. I just hope he manages to achieve his goal in the sequel, otherwise placing this entry in my top 5 ain't gonna age well at all. You know where you're going! Well, I have a plan! I just haven't told you yet! Like the world wasn't ready for this movie back in 2013, you know, but I think that they should be now. It's become something of a cult hit, and I really appreciate Zack Snyder for trying to be different rather than going by the formula. Destroying the world engine isn't a regular daytime task, and even for a god level entity like Superman, but he still gets the job done because he's the man of his word. Whether it was him taking off in supersonic speed, fighting those weird Doc Ock tentacles, or the eventual surge into the world engine, Kalel proved his merit in truly grandiose fashion. That massive scream at the end showed his determination and established Henry Cavill as the modern generation's Clark Kent. Unfortunately, James Gunn doesn't feel that way about him. First of all, can we just appreciate the fact that this movie is over 32 years old and still holds strong? James Cameron before the 2000s was a cinematic genius and it shows in films like this one, Aliens and even True Lies. As far as the bike versus truck scene in Judgment Day goes, all I can say is that Arnold Schwarzenegger has never looked cooler in any role before this one. Like, it's cool enough that he's the freaking Terminator, but bro's literally shooting at a truck from a bike and ends up victorious. Doesn't matter how old I get, seeing Arnie reload that shotgun with such sass will forever be badass to me. I really miss seeing stuff like this in the cinemas nowadays.
there is no scene in the history of the MCU that can ever match the feeling we got when we all saw this in the theaters. Avengers Endgame was the culmination of over a decade of hard work, coherent stories, and a fan base that could even rival BTS stands Swifties. It was the perfect moment for all of us because not only did it undo the massive depression that came at the end of Infinity War, it also gave us each and every superhero from this universe all together for a single cause. Calling it epic would actually be an understatement because it seriously can't get more badass than this. Seeing all those guys charge at the enemy in full form gave me goosebumps that lasted over a week. I can watch this scene over and over again and still get just as emotional as I did when the first time I saw it. That's when you know you've got a winner. It would have felt a lot better to see Black Widow and Vision 2. That's just a minor complaint in what's otherwise the greatest crossover in all of cinema. Yeah, I said that right. Martin Scorsese might have his reservations, but you can't deny the facts. Is that everyone? Like you wanted more? Hope you like this video. Please subscribe to the TV region. Here's another video that you'll enjoy.